So I, I'm going to share a, just a brief story and, and a little reflection on our text this morning as well. It, it's just such a joy to see everyone here this morning and to have this chance to, to celebrate with Peter's music. We laughed last night as we were visiting because as you, as you listen to his music and oftentimes as you experience 1111 in here and the way it's designed, it's almost if I know some of you are thinking this, you're going like, you really don't need to say anything, Tom. <laughs> it's all here. And of course, with Peter's, Peter's songs, they're just as, they're just, where is Peter? He's gone, okay. That's <laughs> yeah, all right. He'll be back, I hope. So, um, this time of year it brings a lot of memories, it brings a lot of feelings, it brings a lot of emotions across the spectrum of, of, our, of our lives and our experiences. And I, I like remembering family moments. Uh, I've, I've grown to, to love them. I've grown to appreciate them for all of their diverseness and strangeness. The, the Christmas at the McDermott's house I've, I've talked about in the past. I, I just, it, it is such... We'll have a Christmas party um, on, on sun, uh, Christmas night with all the family. And everyone is there in spite of ourselves. Everyone shows up. And we'll have the diversity on every spectrum. We'll have the animal rights activists, and we'll have the avid hunters and the NRA card-carrying family members. And we'll have the devout Republicans, and we'll have the, the uh, extremist anarchists, and not to mention liberals and socialists. We'll have all of these folks. We'll have gay and straight. We'll have the, the, my, my, my um, nephew, who would be proud if I was mentioning this, who's in his 30s now, and he's, uh, I think he's the past high lord of the North Texas region of the Middle Ages Association. He's part of the Anachronistic Society, the Creative Anach Society for Creative Anachronism, and sometimes would come in, in dress, in fact, for it, sometimes either wearing a kilt or sometimes wearing armor and always with weaponry in the trunk. And, <laughs> and it just makes for, you know, an interesting Christmas. And then uh, this last one was, the, was a wonderful surprise where, where my brother came up and said, by the way, Tommy, you haven't met these folks, but these are your, your step a nephew and nieces twice or thrice removed from your step second stepmother on her si on her husband's side and they're in town so i thought i'd invite them over it's just that kind of mix of everything and it doesn't seem like it should mix it honestly seems like and we have our conversations that turn into debates and if we're not careful they become departures but the reality is that if we just sit back and just listen and pay attention to one another, oftentimes we find some common ground that reminds us why we're family. It reminded me of this particular, for some reason this particular season, reminded me of a story that I used to love. My grandmother's house was the place we went to for Christmas as a kid. And when we went in, my uncle was always there to greet us on my mother's side, her brother, and he'd give us the vice grip handshake, and he'd say, this is going to hurt me more than it is you, and it never did. It always hurt me more than it did him. And then he would, sit, then he would try to usher us in and, and move us in one direction, but my grandmother, we, after she'd plant her kiss on us, she would always say, I know right where you boys want to go. And she'd say, I want you, you can go on back to your grandfather's office. He was a doctor. She said, go on back to your grandfather's office. Don't touch the bottom drawers of his desk. And that's what she'd say. And, and of course, she'd say, you can, you can rifle through the top drawers because there are all sorts of weird little trinkets and interesting things in the top drawers, including a gold pocket watch that he got from the BSNF NF Railroad because he did a lot of uh, medical service for them. And I kept that. I still have that gold watch to this day. And uh, it, was, it's, it just was wonderful. It was like being in Alice's Wonderland, going through all these little drawers. You've seen these roll-top desks and the drawers behind drawers. And, and then, of course, we remembered not to go to the bottom drawers, Right? which is exactly where we went, <laughs> which is what she knew because there were always stories in the bottom. There was always these, my, some of my favorite stories. Um, one of them was Where's Waldo? I always loved that one because I always loved the idea of being hidden to where nobody could find you. Just, you just kind of blend in with the crowd. It just, and then trying to find him was kind of this wonderful adventure. The other, one was, uh, the, the other one was the little engine that could, right? I think I can, I think I can. And that one kind of got me through some of my first dates. <laughs> you know, and, 
And, and I loved that one. But then, one of, but my favorite one was this one called The Mitten. And it was in a collection of, 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 of Eastern folk tales, Europe, Eastern European folk tales. I believe it was a Euro- Ukrainian story originally. And The Mitten, some of you remember this old story, and it's been picture books ever since then. But it's the story of the little boy during the wintertime who leaves his mitten, he loses it, and he leaves it in the woods. And then animals try to squeeze inside that mitten one by one until it just seems impossible that another animal could get in there, much less that the ones that are in there shouldn't be there together. There's a mouse, there's a rabbit, there's a fox, there's a tiger, there's a, all these different, there's birds, and then a bear, a grizzly bear comes along who should make a meal of all of these other animals. But they open up the, the uh, mitten and they find room. And it's just this wonderful imagination of how is this possible to stretch this thing beyond belief to where there's room for everybody. And to me, that becomes the perfect metaphor for the nativity, for what this story is all about, this ancient story of everybody at this nativity, at this stable, who shouldn't be there. Not by traditional sense, not by by the ancient Jewish sense, not by their own traditions and expectations. These people shouldn't be there. The woman who's pregnant and not married. Joseph, who's not really anybody except that he's got a lineage to go with himself. And and the shepherds, who are the lowest of the lows, and they're there, and the wise men who show up in the other gospel story, who really shouldn't. None of them should be there. And it seems like that was all of Jesus' life throughout the whole gospel story, is you shouldn't be talking to these people. You shouldn't be working with these people. You shouldn't be helping these people. The mitten seems just like the perfect metaphor for what it means to be a part of the kingdom, for what it means to be in the presence of the holy, for what it means to to be connected to where the light is in our midst. And it's not always easy because this particular time of year also is wrought with expectation, as much as it's wrought with disappointment. It's wrought with, with our desires. Our, as, as children, the desires were we wanted exactly what we wanted, right? We expect to get what we wanted. And parents, we, fl- you know, we, we work, we, we struggle, we want to make sure we get it, and we set it up just right, and, and we want to make sure Santa Claus knows all about it, and we expect the perfect gift. And my mother, when, after she got divorced, knew how hard that was going to be, working full time, and she often would tell me, you know, the difference between a pessimist and an optimist, and she would describe the pessimist. You know, the pessimist was the person who got a bike but was complaining about the color after he got the bike. And the optimist was the person who got a box of horse manure but was flipping in there going, there's a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> we told that story to our son, our oldest son, Tim, one day, and we said, so Tim, you hear that? Which would you rather be, an optimist or a pessimist? He said, I'd rather be Episcopalian. But that's the way Christmas is. It's this hodgepodge of things that don't make sense, things that do make sense. All of the traditions that we place on what Christmas is supposed to be like. All of our own mythology that we start to associate with this story. That it becomes law. It becomes concrete for us. And we miss the wonder and the mystery that's there present. And some of what I noticed that I've had the hardest time over the years that I'm finally opening up to at Christmas time is ticky-tacky Christmas. I wore my tie in honor of this message. It's a red tie with a melted Frosty. And it says, tragically, Frosty's first cup of hot cider turned out to be his last. <laughs> and so many people are comfortable with, right, right? The ugly Christmas sweaters, it's such a tradition, the, the lights around the neck at Christmas time and at the parties, the antlers... And then the decorations, you know, you drive through the beautiful neighborhoods, and we live over near West Side, and you drive around in certain neighborhoods, and everything's together, right? You know, it's, it's, worse, than the, it's worse than Christmas with the cranks. I mean, they are like uniform, and, and so you have white lights everywhere, and you almost could see the house that was dark probably went dark because they only had mixed lights, and they weren't about to put those up. You know, so everything is in order. Everything is proper, and it's beautiful, and yet there's something missing. 
And then you drive around in our neighborhood, and sure enough, you drive around the corner, and the house that was completely decorated with the most amazing assortment of Halloween items, I mean, just overwrought with everything from every possible Halloween movie, every animated thing, every traditional you know, uh, image from... I, well, now for Christmas, my wife and Linda and I were walking in the neighborhood, and three weeks ago, there were only sort of runway lights at the sidewalk that were kind of going opposite each other like that, and we were so disappointed. But night after night, we realized what was going on. They they were adding stuff because they knew people were coming by. They knew people were waiting. And so they just kept adding things. And they'd have Santa Claus the reindeer. And then they have the Charlie Brown nativity. And then they had the regular, nat- the traditional nativity. And then they had the Star Wars nativity. <laughs> and just one by one, they kept adding things. And I kept thinking, you know, my Lin- Linda's first response was, she said, well, that's just so wrong. <laughs> You know, and I'm thinking, no, it's so right. There's something right. I can't put my finger on it. And then one night I come home. We've got some neighbors. Now, so I'm talking about my neighbors. Uh, I'm talking about my family and my neighbors, okay? So um, I'm I'm doing it for you in public here. But the, um, the right across the street... The, a new family moved in, but they go in the back door, so we never see them. You know how neighbors, we don't really know each other very well, and it's just one of these challenges overcoming these sort of cultural barriers we have today. So they go in the back door, but they put some lights around, just a strand of lights, and it was nice. And, and I came home one night, at, right, before, right before sunset, it was like 5 o'clock, and there was a 15-foot blow-up Santa in the front yard. <laughs> Nothing else, just the Santa. Just standing there, skinny and tall. My son calls him too tall to dunk. And he's he's huge. He's 15 feet. As soon as it gets dark, he disappears. I haven't been able to figure it out yet why that's happening. He's not up during the night. He's only up during the daytime. And he's so large, you can see him from three blocks down the street. He's up above the trees. And, and, I, and at first, we're looking at him going, you know, we wake up in the morning. There he is, right across the street, staring at us. And then next door is a little minion that's waiting there beside, you know. And, and, and Linda's like, well, isn't that terrible? And I'm thinking, you know, at first it was. But now I'm realizing something. And I saw it last, uh, two nights ago at my son's graduation. At his graduation at UTA, 1,000 students graduating that night. And we were so proud of him for graduating. And we went there. Yeah, we were so excited. Yep. <laughs> Some of y'all know Tim's story, and you know just how phenomenal that was, and he graduated with honors. We're just really proud of him. But um, And and he said, I'm doing this for you because I'm so counter to all of this traditional institutional stuff. He says, but I'm going to do it for you. And so he got up there. He wore the robe. He had the cap. he, He made the honors. He said, but you have to ring a cowbell or blow a horn or something. Because they got the letter that said, behave yourself, right? That's what they said, behave yourself. You can cheer, you can clap, but behave yourself. Well, most everybody had a various cheer, but there weren't very many noisemakers. But there was a woman behind us who had a cowbell from Pascal, and she rang it. And we looked at the little party favors that Tim bought us to blow and realized in that huge coliseum nobody was going to hear it. So Linda leans back and she says, I need your bell. (laughs) And the lady just smiled and she handed it over. So when Tim got up there, blew the bell. But here's what was interesting. Such an assortment of people at UTA, such a multicultural environment, right? So... (laughs) We're watching everybody march across, and they're just doing their traditional thing, shaking all the dean's hands as they cross. Everyone's in their robes and the stripes and all. And then one woman suddenly comes up there, looks out at the crowd, and then she goes. (laughs) And she literally walks past all of the deans like this and, and doesn't shake their hand after she's got her diploma. And then she dances off the stage. Well, that kind of broke it loose, and then for the next 10 people, you know, they all kind of tried to do something, and then it got traditional again, but, but it was interesting because I saw, I saw a woman there in a burqa, I mean, a Muslim in a burqa, but it was bright with sparkles all over it underneath the robe, and she was wearing huge red platform heel shoes, and I thought, how perfect, you know, and she came out and she got her diploma and then towards the end, and she did, I don't know what it was, it's a Middle Eastern dance, but she did it right there on the stage. And it was just wonderful to see all of this diversity, all of it being expressions. And I remember something Thomas Merton said, and I want to end this with, with this and to, and to give you this to think about this Christmas. Thomas Merton, who um, Peter Mayer comes from the Jesuit tradition and studied in the Jesuit tradition, and Thomas Merton was a, a Jesuit, and, um, 
And one of the things which he said, I'm not going to get the quote exact, but it's in the seventh story mountain. One of the things he said was something to the effect of, why do we spend so much time trying to be something other than who we really are? Because isn't that where God is speaking to us most deeply? Somehow when we true, and those of you who, who've been there, who are here, know that. Somehow when we get to that place where we are truly who we are, when we finally sort of found that way of expressing ourselves and connecting deeply to who we are, that we feel something miraculous has happened, something amazing has happened. And even if we only experience it from time to time, it's still that glimpse of where I think the light breaks through the dark, breaks into our reality. And all of that kitschy stuff, all of that ticky-tacky stuff, all of that bravado and fun stuff on the stage, sometimes I'm tempted to go, you know, cool it, calm down. Let's get back to normal tradition and look at the good stuff. Let's just keep things the way they're supposed to be. Sometimes when I look at all of that other stuff, I realize they're all trying to find that same expression. It's just a way of saying we're trying to find that way of saying who we really are. It's an opportunity not to dismiss, but to invite in that inner call to be more authentic. So this Christmas season, I know there's going to be a lot of mixed me, me, uh, feelings, mixed emotions. And there'll be moments for joy and there'll be moments for reflecting and sadness. But the one thing that I think connects us, God's presence in the world, we begin to experience when we don't forget to just breathe, to just take a breath, a shared reality we share with one another wherever we are and to stop in that moment. And then, just wonder. If it's what's going on, say, I wonder what's going on. If it's something you're looking at going, that's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen, go, I wonder why they did that. I wonder what I could think about from that. And the last thing which I think is what we're told to do in Micah when we're asked to love God, to love justice and mercy and walk humbly, I think we're simply asked to love. Breathe, wonder, and love. See if you can't find an opportunity to do that a little bit this Christmas holiday. Amen.